just want to reflect now on my observations of key lessons, both in my time in Australia, but in my peacekeeping missions as UNMO and as Force Commander. And there are three. The first one is a gender perspective. The second is inclusive leadership. And the third is the he for she. Uh, first up to Ingrid, to Maureen. I can't see where she sat down. But um, I just want to say thank you for your inspiring words. And globally, it's actually very similar. There are many similarities. And I would also say for our colleagues uh, on the Peace Operations course, you would have many uh, observations that you would take away. But distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to join you today. It's a real privilege for me to be here. And uh, I couldn't think of anywhere else that I'd prefer to be. And His Excellency, thank you for breaking down the barriers. Christenland um, was the first, and Ingrid and I have both had the opportunity to follow, and we're forever grateful because we believe in ourselves. We believe in what we can contribute, and it's actually people like yourself and for all those in the room that believe in us that can give us the opportunity to thrive. And for that, um, I'm, I'll be forever thankful for that. Um, to the Women Peace Operations course, um, congratulations on your selection and your completion. You are our future. You are what inspires me now, and my sense of purpose is to give back to developing, to grow our next future leaders. And, uh, you know, this is a great opportunity here. Grasp it with both hands and go forth. You've got a lot to offer. I can't wait to see you succeed. This afternoon, I'm just going to, I will keep it short. I just want to cover off on three things. One is I'm going to, just my backstory, and then secondly, my observations and learnings from my, both my background uh, in Australia and my deployments both under the Australian flag and the UN flag. And then are my recommendations on the way forward for women empowerment and women development within peacekeeping. But my backstory is a long, long, long time ago. But um, 37 years, young 18-year-old uh, who joined the military and uh, come from a small country town, had one brother, very sporty. I wanted to make a difference. Um, I knew, I didn't know what it was, but I knew what it felt. And for that was um, following uh, my dream and my goals to make, to make that difference. I joined the army. It was the first year of integrated training. And uh, it was the first time that men and women had trained together. And there was so much emphasis on being equal, that it wasn't equal in some ways. We were less than 5%, very small numbers, but very much a focus on uh, making sure that we completed everything exactly the same as the males, that we thought the same, we were educated the same, we trained the same, that actually our differences were not um, recognised or even um, supported. So that first decade for me, and if I talk in decades, um, I apologise for those that are still in the first, but for those um, in decades, that first 10 years was, um, was tough. You're really trying to give it your all, to be your best, to make it work, to lead the best you can lead, and, but you want to fit in. You don't want to put your head above the parapet. You don't want to be singled out as, as being different. But what I found in my observations looking back was it actually held me back. I didn't use my voice enough. I didn't give that diversity of thinking. I didn't want to be seen to be different. I just wanted to be the same as everyone else. And equally, I didn't um, go and pursue goals that I wanted to do. I waited to be asked. I wasn't proactive in my own development. I always thought everyone else would know what's best for me not what I thought was best for me and where I, could be to, where I could go and what I could do. I flip into my second decade, I want it all. I switch, I want it all. I wanted motherhood, I wanted a career, I wanted to be able to deploy, I wanted to serve my country and how do I make it all happen? There were no females ahead of me that had children, that deployed, um, that served and that commanded an operational battalion how do I do this? And so I was trying to find mentors that could challenge my thinking and individually seeking out people to help me on my journey. And, um, but it wasn't forthcoming 
to me. Someone didn't say, hey, Cheryl, let's have a chat. Let's, what is it you want to do? It was actually me being a little bit more proactive myself. The other one that happened in that period was really, how do you do it with children? How do you? How do you get the support network? As they say, it takes a village to support. So I had friends, I, had, I didn't have family in the same location that rallied around and looked after my children so I could go to work at 6.30 in the morning to do physical training, that I could disappear at short notice on deployments, that I could serve overseas for long periods of time. So getting that support network was really, really essential um, for me. But probably the biggest thing that happened in that second um, decade was me deciding my own leadership style. I spent that first decade trying to lead in a way that I was taught. And it was a very masculine leadership style. It didn't actually suit me. And I kept on adjusting off. I knew what was natural, but I adjusted off to what I was taught. And I'm a values-based, inclusive leader. And as a junior leader, it didn't quite fit. And I could adjust and I could think one way and then adjust off and think another. But that second decade, when people believed in me that I had the um, potential and provided me the opportunity to command a battalion, I suddenly developed my own authentic leadership style and designed and was able to lead how I thought a leader should be. And over that next decade, I was able to continue to develop and thrive in the environments and do what was intuitive to me based on my education and training and able to create environments where those that I led were able to also thrive. So this second decade then turns into a third. And the third decade as a senior leader, in my second decade I had the opportunity to deploy as a military observer in, in uh, East Timor with the United Nations. In my third decade, um, when I became more of a senior leader, I, had, I was very privileged to have a lot of um, command and leadership opportunities and deploying to Afghanistan as the Australian Task Force Commander, um, UNFASIP as a force commander, um, and also commanded our Defence Academy back in Australia. And it was during that period that I really focused on developing an inclusive leadership, not just for myself, but in policy direction, and um, within those that I led. Equally, you're able to, as a senior officer, change policy, be able to influence policy changes, whether it be, um, and all the barriers that come up for women. How do you shift the policy? How do you create a culture? How do you create change over an enduring period and be part of that strategy? I spent too much of my career being an issue. It's a women's issue, the women's problem, versus actually how do we look at it as a path for good? What is it that we can bring to the table? What is that strategy for change to have a more inclusive and diverse workforce? So that's been my career and now, and the sort of towards the end of it is sitting as a Deputy Chief of Army and really being able to reflect back and uh, be able to guide and lead some of those changes and create the conditions that those coming through can now succeed and thrive in that perhaps many of us didn't have when we were more junior officers. So I'm military police by trade. Infantry didn't come and wasn't open to females in the Australian Army in 2016. It was then um, that all our uh, employment specialties opened up, which was quite late in comparison to some of the other areas, but equally, um, it slowly opened up and legislation changed over time of where we could deploy it and how we could deploy. I just want to reflect now on my observations of key lessons, both in my time in Australia, but in my peacekeeping missions as UNMO and as force commander. And there are three. The first one is a gender perspective. The second is inclusive leadership. The third is the he for she. Just in the first one, gender perspective. I always thought I didn't I thought differently and I looked at a problem in a different way and we do operational planning and I'd look at it slightly different and then adjust back. And it wasn't until I could reflect after serving in East Timor that the value of my gender perspective brought to the table. And that was we would do our planning, we'd go out and do patrolling and I'd be listening quite differently to the issues of the communities for which we patrolled and visited. It was 
the water pipe that didn't work. It was the um, books that weren't in the right language for the schools. It was in a different language. I heard about the physical security and the bigger issues, but I knew that if we had addressed some of the smaller issues so that the community could feel safe, they knew the education of their children was being addressed, then the bigger physical security issues could also be addressed. And by taking those back and bringing that back into the system, I was able to change. And that commitment of returning again and again, they would then start to ask for me. I was the only female unmo at the time. And so by the time the voice gets around to the villages, all of a sudden, everybody else wants more women. There's only one, and to get around to the different communities. So the people saw the value in it, and I could finally see the value in it. Take it up to the senior level as force commander. That gender perspective was key. You've suddenly got the ability to influence and control the operational planning, the direction in which the peacekeeper is going to be working and operating with inside the buffer zone, and also how you're going to engage as part of your relationships with the opposing force commanders. So that gender perspective really brought it in. And I know Ingrid would agree with me, both having served, but I, we're actually a force multiplier. Not only with that blue beret could we have respect in engaging with opposing force commanders, but equally we could communicate with the communities, uh, the Turkish and the uh, Greek Cypriot communities within the female um, empowerment teams there to actually make a difference. We're able to, as I would call in military terms, be a real force multiplier. The second one is inclusive leadership. We all want to feel safe, we want to feel like we have a voice. We want to be respected. It doesn't matter our background, our gender, our um, culture, our education, our training. We all want to be respected for our voice. And creating that inclusive environment and through good leadership is essential for success in peacekeeping missions and in our own countries. We will thrive if we're given the opportunity to do that. But if we don't feel safe and if our voice is not heard, we will shut down and we will opt out. We're all smart women. We will opt out and not wish to serve if we're not respected for our voice and for be, wanting to be part of the solution. So that leadership is key. And it's, um, I saw it work really badly and really well throughout my career. And if, you're not, if they're not interested in what you say, if you're not valued and you don't feel like you have a sense of purpose, you feel like there's no point at some times. Why? Why do we continue to do it? And uh, there are other options. It's a real retention. The last one is linked to that is the he for she. I'd say that first decade of mine, nobody believed in the success of women in the military. It was very limited and it was made very difficult. But as I become more senior and people would just put out a word, I believe in you, thank you, well done. It only has to be little words, just the start. And then I started believing in myself because you don't hear it. Um, sometimes our peers, as Maureen said, um, our harshest critics. And just to say, hey, well done, just brings you up a little bit. We don't look for it, but it is good. But then to have the he for she, the advocacy, I know we can talk in a women for, uh, room full of women. We're already converted. We know the strength we bring to the table. I look to the males in the room and I go, do you know what we can bring to the table? How can we get you to be our biggest advocates? I need you to be my advocate going forward because your voice and the areas that we can't get to is where we need the change. And then it's a big change. It's a policy change. It's a framework change. How do we break down those barriers? So there are my three observations and at each level in my career, I've been able to see each of those in a, at a different perspective as we go through. The last one for me really is um, in recommendations. And the recommendations, um, the first one is education and training, but on two different levels. We talk about and we see such um, real growth in, in the training of our female peacekeepers. For them to thrive and for a female peacekeeper to thrive, it's not just about numbers. They have to, we have to be trained. You have to have the ability to do, do the job that you've been appointed to, not the one that someone thinks you should be doing when you arrive in mission. You have to be sent to the 
um, position that you've been posted to and to be employed in that position, not something else that is an administrative job because somebody doesn't think you should be doing um, a role outside the wire. Um, that is really important. But give them the education and the training that they need to fulfil their duties to the best of their ability. Really key. Um, it gives them confidence. It gives it empowers them as we talk with them. It's a real empowerment tool if you know you're qualified and trained to do the job that you're being sent to do. But equally, have the confidence in them to do it and not put them into another role. So that's really key. The other education and training one for me, and it's my observations over time, is been we need to provide the education and training to our senior um, force commanders and senior leadership. Many member states, um, some of our senior leadership, and I'd say at the OF4 and above, have not experienced leading women. Many of them are not experienced having females in their militaries and therefore we're, we're a bit foreign to them. And so how do you lead? And they will, you know, for the right reasons, their own beliefs will come in and they will want to protect or they'll think that you can't do it or they will have a perception about what we can and can't do. So how do we give them the education and the skills on working with us? Um, empower them to understand what we bring to the table. Really, really key. But down to about um, a major lieutenant colonel level, different individual education and training for those that are accountable as commanders, but then collective training for those um, that are in key staff roles. Because I have seen firsthand how, and we have a lot more female peacekeepers in staff roles now, but I can f see how they're easily dismissed by somebody that doesn't know their worth and what they bring to the table. So really key. So that's the education and training. The second one is inclusive leadership. We assume that by wearing a rank, you're going to be a good leader. Um, I don't buy into that. We have a lot of bad leaders. I have them in Australia. I'm sure many of the member states have bad leadership. It's actually about as we um, recruit and we look at the selection criteria and, and as we pick, we should be looking for this, for good leadership in it, not just by, by you've done all of these jobs. Some, somewhere in the selection criteria is to pick up and some of the questioning in, in interview. Equally, I would um, offer that if we, through the evaluation series in missions, actually have it as, an, as a measure um, and we bring back and have a measure of, um, of that inclusivity, the safe, psychological safety, how females employed as part of the evaluation series, as soon as it is measured, people will adjust. So I, I really do believe we need to measure it as well. But that inclusive leadership is a growth one. And how do we grow? Because not only about attracting female peacekeepers to missions, to our peacekeeping missions, how do we retain them? How do we grow the Ingrids and Maureens? We have all served as junior officers. And in the main, we've had a positive experience and we volunteer to put a hand up again and to be considered for senior appointments. What about the many females that had such a horrific experience or did not enjoy their peacekeeping? They're not going to put their hand up again to come back. You can't buy us. You can't say, hey, I want this as a force commander. Um, we've got to grow us. And the selection criteria requires that we have to be in, come through a peacekeeping mission as a junior officer to be a senior. So without inclusive and really good leadership, why would we come back? Why would we volunteer again? So it's on us to make sure that we enable our junior females to thrive and want to put their hand up to come back again and again. Um, so that's, that's the second one. And the third one is policies. I know, and um, congratulations to UN Women, to DPO, there's a lot of work done in the gender parity strategy and some really work it done at how to um, set the policies and frameworks right to go forward. And that continual work inspires me. And you know, there are different ways, talent management, pipelines, having a look at how we can track, how is the Women Peace Operations course today? How do we have all your names in the system to ensure that opportunities are provided for you within, within the missions that your country is serving to make sure that you get the opportunities to deploy? Um, really key. Some of the frameworks, we have flexible work environments in most of our um, countries at the moment. 
how can we adjust deployment timelines to assist those that have got the really young children that can't, say, leave for 12 months? How do we make it shorter? How can we set the conditions? It's not all a cookie cutter all the time. We should be looking at that differentiation sometimes to ensure we can create those opportunities for females to come through. And that links back to the he for she. I can talk about that all day, but I'm not gonna be in the room all the time. It's that thinking about it, thinking about reasons to opt in, not opt out. And it's that differentiation, as I know they're doing now, in opting in, and that's really important as we go forward. So really, just in conclusion, I just wanna um, thank again the opportunity to join you uh, the, today and really to um, hand over the reins to our young, young females who have just finished, uh, women that have just finished a peace operations course, and uh, to say that, you know, our future is in your hands in the peacekeeping, and uh, I couldn't think of a better place for, for this handover to occur. So thank you, and thanks to everybody. Thank you. Thank you.